Hey, everybody, we'll get started in just about a minute. Um, Hey, everybody. Thank you for joining um, today's CLE. Um, my name is Andy Cole, and I'm the Pro Bono Coordinator at West Tennessee Legal Services. A couple of quick housekeeping notes. Everyone will be muted, so um, we're in webinar format. So if you have any questions or anything, you can ask in the chat function. Um, I will be monitoring it as we go. You should have received an email with a link for CLE credit and materials earlier um, today. If you did not, um, I can, I'll resend those out at the end of the webinar and the webinar is being recorded. So we will be placing it up. So anybody that wasn't able to watch the whole thing today, will be able to go back and watch it for CLE credit. Um, but I will go ahead, Justice Bivens, I will let you um, get started um, and then we'll go from there. All right. Thank you, Andy. Glad to be with everyone here today. I, can, uh, I cannot hear you for some reason. Uh, okay. It says I'm unmuted, but. Oh. I cannot hear you because my volume was not turned up oh, on okay. my computer. That is why. Sorry about that. Is that better? Can, can yeah. you hear me now? Yes, I can okay. hear you. That great. was my fault. Okay, great. All right. Thanks, Andy, for, for inviting me to be a part of this here today, and thanks so much for putting this together. I just did want to take a very short time to talk to you about the importance of uh, pro bono work and, and how it's it really is a responsibility of us as lawyers. And we, we are very blessed to, to be in our profession. You know, our, we hear a, a lot of shots at our profession from time to time, but I still like to think it's a noble profession where we were able to provide service to our clients uh, in, in many different ways. But part of that involves the ability to give uh, service to clients that can't afford to pay us either. You know, many, many of us have had uh, jobs working in private practice and, and law firms, uh, and of course, then many uh, on here are, are public service. But re regardless of that, and in particularly those that are in private practice, I think there is responsibility on, on, on you to, de to donate some of your time to do pro bono work to help those of our citizens that, that can't afford to uh, hire a lawyer to represent them. So many times uh, in, uh, in our country, we talk about uh, equal justice and, and access to justice for all. Uh, our court, of course, has made access to justice its number one priority for a number of years, both through the creation of the Access to Justice Commission uh, and as our just commitment generally to uh, providing those, those services and providing leadership in that area in conjunction with the legal services uh, agencies as well. So we do feel like it's a very important part of what has to be done. Uh, when you take that oath of office and you get, get the privilege of practicing law, th that responsibility comes with it. Uh, and the responsibility is not simply to, uh, to be there and, and be, uh, bill an hour and, and get paid for it and for those that, that can afford it. There's nothing wrong with that. And, and that's certainly a part of our system. That system works, but that system doesn't necessarily work well for those that uh, low-income people, people who have had troubles, uh, and people who are who can't afford to, to buy a lawyer, who's lost their job, who's been evicted, any of those things that happen. But yet, they're still they're still our citizens too, and they're entitled to that representation, just like us. And, and because our, our organizations do a wonderful job, but they simply do not have the staff to cover. Uh, every anything and everything that happens when they come in the door, 
that falls back on, on us, those, those that are out, outside of the actual organizations themselves, to provide the pro bono work. You know, we, we recognize pro bono efforts across the state, particularly this month, it's Pro Bono Recognition Month. We had recently a pro bono recognition event at Belmont Law School and, and brought in Chief Justice Nathan Heck from the state of Texas. Uh, Texas does a tremendous job in providing their access to justice for folks that can't afford it, and, and they are a true model for that. So we're, we're trying to find all ways we can to promote this, to ask for your help in that, uh, and to make sure that we can get the, the pro bono work necessary to do that. Uh, we, we do recognize those who report service of 50 hours or more per year, and in starting next year, we're going to have an even uh, higher level for those who provide 100 hours or more, and you'll be hearing more about that in December, but uh, it'll be a program where we can recognize folks to do that. And I know many of you don't do it for recognition, and recognition's not the big thing, but, but we're happy to do that as well because it is an important part of what we do. But I think the even bigger part of it is I hear so many stories from lawyers that have provided pro bono service talking about they are the winners and, and they are the ones that, that have the great feeling after they're able to help someone. You know, helping someone with a landlord-tenant issue, helping someone with a domestic violence issue, uh, helping someone with uh, medical care, any, anything or medical debt, any of those things are, are life and debt for a, a lot of folks. And I, the, the thing that I always uh, I think about as having been a trial judge in a district that ran from, that was uh, had Williamson, Hickman, Lewis, and Perry counties in it. So I've covered uh, obviously a county that's that's one if not the wealthiest county in the state. But I also had counties like Perry County that was one of the poorest counties in the state. And in domestic cases that I had, uh, the folks in, the, like, in divorces, uh, the, the folks in Brentwood would be arguing over their million-dollar home as one part of, the, of their assets, and one part of their estate. You go down to, to Linden, Tennessee and try a, a divorce case, and they're at odds over who gets a $10,000 trailer. Well, that $10,000 trailer may be the only asset those people have and where to live. So it's incredibly important that it, even I as a judge at that point take the time and it's and necessary to do what's right to make sure and hear everyone out and do that. But, it, but because of that, it's equally important that lawyers reach out and represent people like that, that lawyers turn back, give something back to uh, the practice and to the profession to help us truly keep it a noble profession. So I, I appreciate uh, the opportunity to be with you here today. I thank Andy for putting this together. I think this is a great idea as far as uh, promoting the pro bono work uh, and, and plus the great work that West Tennessee uh, Legal Services do in general. But it's, uh, it's a great opportunity for me to do that. Again, the court to a person is fully committed to access to justice and pro bono work. We have actually now, as of September 1st, had a complete turnover of our court since the beginning of the Access to Justice Commission uh, many years ago. But I can say to a person, all five of us on this court today are, are totally committed to access to justice. We're totally committed to pro bono work. And I could not uh, more strongly encourage you and tell you that it is, it is not only something that's good, it's something that's a responsibility. So thank you for having me here today. Uh, Andy, I appreciate it, and I look forward to the rest of this. Hope you have a good rest of the seminar. Great. Thank you so much, Justice Bivens, for taking the time to um, to do this with us. And um, I know you're on the road, so I'll let you um, go ahead and get on back. That's fine. All right. Glad I, glad I could work it out. Okay. We'll yeah. Take care. Yeah. See you guys. All right. Bye -bye. Thank you so much. Bye. All right, everybody. We will go ahead. Um, and get started. Um, let me share my screen. Let me share the PowerPoint and find the right button. If someone could confirm um, if they're seeing, I have a fear that they're seeing, that y'all are seeing the slide, my version instead of the regular one. 
So, okay, perfect. Um, I will go ahead and get started. Like I said earlier, my name is Andy Cole and I am the pro bono coordinator at West Tennessee Legal Services. And um, I will just kind of quickly talk about what West Tennessee Legal Services does, who we are. So we are a nonprofit providing civil legal aid to help underserved individuals, families, and communities in 17 counties in West Tennessee. Essentially, we cover every county um, in West Tennessee except for Shelby County, Waterdale, Tipton, and Fayette counties. Um, we cover all of the other rural counties. Um, we have four offices in Jackson, Dyersburg, Selmer, and Huntington. And um, our list of priorities are access to healthcare, securing or retaining housing, securing or retaining income, security of abuse and in institutionalized persons, and issues that affect family safety and stability. Um, that kind of breaks down into what our primary services are. Um, so this is not everything that we do, but this is a big portion of what we do as an organization, whether that's through our in-house attorneys or through volunteers. Um, we do a lot of housing work where we help people in wrongful evictions or fair housing, um, as well as foreclosure assistance. We do a lot of consumer work with debt collection, garnishment, unfair sales practices. Um, we do a lot of victims' rights work where we help people who need orders of protection, um, domestic violence divorces, domestic violence custody situations, and safety planning. Um, we have an elder law unit where we help people with simple wills and powers of attorneys, public benefits, um, debt and housing. Um, we have our more, most recent unit, which is our disaster unit, um, where we've received grants to help people who have been victims of natural disasters, um, mainly the largest one being the tornadoes that hit Northwest Tennessee in December of 2021. We have attorneys who assist people with applying or mainly appeals for um, government benefits. We also have a new not new, but newer family law unit. Um, and then we have a reentry project, which is mostly done through pro, pro bono, which I will talk about in more detail later. Um, I just wanted to start with a quote from Supreme Court Justice Hugo Black, there can be no equal justice where the kind of trial a man gets depends upon the amount of money he has. This is, you know, one of something we take to heart to make sure that all of our clients, regardless of income, regardless of background, do have the representation, fair representation in court. So I'll talk briefly about the justice gap. Um, so these are some st statistics from the South. Approximately 655,000 eligible problems are brought to legal services organizations annually, and about 69 percent of those in the South um, are not provided any or enough legal help due to restrictions on staff and volunteers. Um, and if you look at this nationally, that number actually increases to 71 percent of people who are turned away and not provided full help. Um, so what does this mean? What's the point of, of saying this? This means that with, you know, our current resources, our current grants and staff, Almost 70% of problems who come into our office or come into a legal aid office are turned away or only partially helped. This doesn't include the people that were denied because their case doesn't have merit or people who are denied because they don't qualify for our services. These are people who are low income, who cannot afford an attorney, who have a legitimate legal problem that we just can't serve because we don't have enough people and enough resources to be able to serve them. So how do we fix this problem? Um, obviously there's, you know, the, the nicest way, which is finding more money, getting more grants, but, you know, there's a lot of people who are fighting for the same grants and there's only a limited pot of money that we can get money from. So the best way to do this and truly address the justice gap is through pro bono and volunteering. So here's another quote from Justice Andrew Day O'Connor um, talking about fulfilling pro bono obligation and public service. Um, 
and the importance of devoting to your community as an attorney. Okay, sorry, I, I moved the chat. So let me see if I can fix the screen since some people are not seeing the right one. There we go. That should fix it. If it didn't, please let me know. So we'll now get into the boring ethics that we all have to talk about so we can get our ethics CLE credit. So why do pro bono? According to the um, rules, uh, lawyers should, should aspire to render at least 50 hours of pro bono public legal services per year. To do this, they should provide a substantial portion of services without fear or expectation to persons of limited means or charitable, religious, civic, community, government, and educational organizations in matters that are designed to primarily address the needs of persons with limited means. I can keep reading this, but you all have it there. Um, so I'll just point out a few things, one of those being the words without fee or expectation of fee. So this means that in order for it to actually count as pro bono services um, to get those 50 hours according to the ethics um, goals, then if you've entered into an arrangement without the expectation of being paid. So these are cases where clients do not, so cases where clients do not pay, when you expected them to, or cases where you're representing somebody for a contingency fee and they don't pay, um, these do not count as pro bono under these rules. Another thing to point out in doing this is the word substantially reduced fee, which I will talk about a little more later. And um, this is generally regarded to mean that if you are taking a fee that is less than half of your normal hourly rate, it's counted as substantially reduced and therefore we count as pro bono work. Um, and this can be paid by the client or by a legal services organization through um, one of our programs that some of us have. Um, and another thing to point out is that a lawyer should voluntary, can voluntarily contribute financial support to organizations as well. So um, these are not the same, these are separate. Um, the ethics rule doesn't say that you should contribute financial support or public service or pro bono work. It says that you should do both of them. Um, so um, if you are inclined to donate time and money, we can definitely take that. Um, and we have opportunities to do that. Um, through several different ways. Here are some comments to the rules. Once again, a minimum 50 hours of pro bono service annually. Um, comment two breaks down in a little more detail some of the individual ways that you can give um, or things can count to pro bono, such as individual and class representation, the provision of legal advice, legislative, lobbying, administrative rulemaking, the provisions of free training or mentoring to those who present who represent persons of limited means. Um, these activities should be participated by government attorneys, even when restrictions exist on engaging the outside practice of law. So that was a lot, that was the boring stuff. And now we can actually break this down into what pro bono does look like moving forward and at West Tennessee Legal Services in particular. So volunteering here, um, as you all know, my name's Andy Cole. I'm the pro bono coordinator. I've been at West Tennessee Legal Services since 2019 and served in the pro bono coordinator role since October of 2020. Um, I, before that, I worked in private practice. I graduated from Belmont Law in 2018. Um, our current big projects that we are working on through pro bono are our reentry project, where we help people with expungements and restoration of citizenship rights, um, simple wills and powers of attorney, our new conservatorship project, which I'll talk about in detail later, and our victims assistance project, where we assist people through a reduced fee program who have been um, victims of domestic violence. 
So to break that stereotype, we have to look at what pro bono is not in 2023. Traditionally, most people, when they think of pro bono work, they think of a law clinic on a Saturday um, where people can come in and ask questions about any different type of research or any different type of legal issue, whether that attorney knows much about it at all. Um, we do not do those at West Tennessee Legal Services, nor do I have any plans to keep doing that. I don't think that that is beneficial for anyone, and I don't think that's a great way to help people, nor do I think that's a good use of any volunteer's time. Another thing that pro bono is not in 2023 is entirely full representation cases. Now, there might be opportunities where if you want to fully represent someone and take on a divorce or a custody action, you can, but that's not the only opportunities you have to assist anybody. Another idea of what pro bono isn't is getting stuck with bad clients you can't withdraw from. Anytime we make a referral to a private attorney who is agreeing to take a case through us, they actually are only agreeing to have a consultation with that client to decide if they want to move forward. All of our private attorneys are actually responsible for their own retainer agreements and they draft those how they wish and they are responsible for their client just like any other client they would take. If they would withdraw from a, that case because their client if it, they were a paying client is not, you know, the type something that they would do, then they can withdraw from that case. Um, if they meet with the client and decide, no, I don't want to do this. This client's lying to everybody. They, um, a volunteer does not have to continue moving forward with that. Additionally, our, our pro bono in 2023, they're not clients who can afford attorneys. So these are clients who all clients through West Tennessee Legal Services have been, have been screened for income and assets to make sure that they cannot afford to pay a private attorney. Um, a lot of times, you know, even if it's a simple issue like a will or drafting a quick claim deed, which for most of us on the call, you know, is not going to be but a couple hundred dollars. For some of our clients who are you know, only getting SSI who might have a disability and living paycheck to paycheck, they can't afford that extra 100 to $200. So these are people who truly can't afford um, anything else. And that's why they've come to us. We do have people quite frequently who come to us for these services who make plenty of money and they are always turned away. They were giving a list of private attorneys and say, you can afford to pay here's a list of people you can call for that issue. Additionally, one thing that we have internally moved away from um, and changed is that our clients are not just the clients, or pro bono clients are not just clients that no internal West Tennessee Legal Services staff attorney wants to deal with. Um, traditionally, in our office, it had been pro bono had kind of been the dumping ground of clients that no are cases that our staff did not want to take. So they sent it to, wanted to send it to a pro bono attorney because they didn't want to deal with it. We have put a big focus on changing that and making sure that that's not the case because it is not fair to ask a volunteer to take a case for free that one of us doesn't want to do while getting paid. So we've change that and we are very careful about what clients we send to volunteers um, as we move forward um, in changing and growing our program. So there are several different types of ways to get involved in pro bono in our office and through many other offices in the state. The first and easiest way to do that is through our virtual clinics. Um, we'll actually at the end of this program time permitting, we'll actually walk through a virtual clinic process from the beginning to the end to show how easy it is. But our clinics are, our virtual clinics mainly cover expungements and simple wills and powers of attorney. However, we also have resources put in place that if a natural disaster hits, we have that ability to step in and help people through disaster, for disaster related services. Um, for all of these clinics, we have forms, we have document automation software that can automatically generate these documents that 
the client needs just by simply having a phone call with the client and not even having to leave your office to meet the client. But we'll go into clinics a little later through our demonstration. The next way to take to do pro bono in 2023 is our newest model that we've worked on, which is virtual representation. We have a new initiative that we are working on for conservatorship cases that allow attorneys that are licensed in Tennessee to take a case that is uncontested conservatorship and appear completely virtually for the entirety of that process. Almost all the chancellors in our service area have agreed to allow this virtual appearance for petitioning attorneys. And actually most of them aren't just on board, they're incredibly excited about this opportunity. They are looking forward to having attorneys who are able to represent these people. And a little backstory on why this has become a big priority for ours and why this started was there's a big need in rural areas for conservatorship cases. In many situations, um, our clients are, have adult children who are, have disabilities who historically they've gone to the bank, they've gone to the doctor and they've been able to handle all their affairs for them. But because there has been a increase in banks being bought out by national banks and doctor's offices being bought out by larger organizations, there's the, now the need for the actual court process to get that conservatorship in place. Through this process, we have people who are now going to be able to take these cases from across the state and be able to represent our clients in a way that we've never been able to before. And like I mentioned earlier, these chancellors are really excited about this opportunity. And there's actually conversations about replicating this across the state um, and providing training to all the judges across the state on how this process works to be able to get that access to justice to more people. But through this process, all volunteers are gonna be, can be provided training and forms to be able to make this process as easy as possible for all of them and to be able to serve as many people as possible. The next way to do pro bono is through limited scope. Um, some people call this unbundled services. I think limited scope is a better understanding of what it is. These are essentially cases that there is a limited representation on what you do. So some of these are going to be you agree to take a case to help a client complete pro se forms for either a divorce or um, other types of projects. One of these, which I mentioned earlier, is our restoration of rights project that we want that we are launching soon. And I'm not sure. I know that. Keita Haynes is on this call, who's really been helping lead this project up for restoration of rights. Um, there might be times where we have to have people who appear either virtually or in person, but part of it's going to be helping complete these forms for people, giving them what they need, walking them through the process um, to allow them to restore their rights if they've been convicted of a felony. Another way we do limited scope is through limited representation. So you might agree to take a case only if it's um, uncontested, only if certain things don't happen. And under the Supreme Court rules, there is a process for that. There's a process where you can submit a notice of limited representation and have you and your client sign a document understanding that you're only limiting your scope to a specific hearing or through a specific time. One example is when a client is denied an appointment of counsel for a dependency and neglect action. We see that quite frequently where we have to ask a pro bono attorney to go to court and file a motion to get somebody's counsel appointed, you know, under the Supreme Court's um, indigency fund. So sometimes we have to have someone appear just to make that motion and just to argue that motion in front of the judge, and then their representation ends after that. Another way we can do limited scope is through drafting simple documents. So drafting affidavits of airship, quick claim deeds, and other documents like that. We see affidavits of airship as a big issue in our office where we have people who are coming in and 
realizing that they don't have the title to their property in their name and it's causing a lot of issues with getting grants and loans and we have to help them get that get that done and it doesn't take very long it takes you know a couple of phone calls from the attorney to the client to fill it out and then everything's done and then it the client can go file it at the clerk's office or the register of deeds office And then there's also the idea of reduced fee. Um, we got a grant um, several years ago under the Victims of Crime Act where we were allowed to provide people with a reduced fee for to take certain cases when people have been victims of domestic violence or parents or grandparents or different people are raising children who may have been victims of child abuse. So we've been able to expand that program under a new grant called Family-Centered Legal Solutions. We are now able to take all these types of cases for people under our reduced fee program. If the client has a child in the home and the client is receiving any form of government benefit, the Family-Centered Legal Solutions grant um, is using the leftover TANF funds to be able to generate a or be able to work on a long-term solution to poverty and focus on all the different aspects of why someone might be in poverty and try to help get them out. So whether that is expungements, someone can't get a job because of their criminal record, or maybe they're having issues with housing and they're not able to get back and forth, or maybe they've just got a consumer issue, a debt collection issue that it just needs to be negotiated um, or needs, you know, just some help trying to create a payment plan on it. So this is really focused on bringing people out of poverty and fixing those long-term solutions. So we're able to do, as you can see on this slide, pretty much any type of legal work on that. And we are really trying to expand this program and expand our offerings so we can help so many people um, with that long-term solution. We also do have the ability under a different grant to help with guardian ad litem appointments for those conservatorship cases um, in certain ones of our counties to be able to pay a guardian ad litem or reduced fee. A few other ways that our office handles pro bono that might not be a way that you're thinking. A lot of times we have law students who want to volunteer. Um, certain law stu schools in the state require pro bono work from all of our law students, from all of their law students before they can graduate. So sometimes with our expungement clinics or wills and POA clinics or with this restoration of rights project we have going on, law students can use our software that you'll see later to generate documents. They'll call the client, they'll get skills to actually um, be able to um, learn how to interview a client, be able to look at documents and understand things. And we'll just need an attorney who can step in and review those, look at those cases, make sure everything was filled out properly. So that's really an easy way to do pro bono work from your couch at night um, or on a weekend um, or really anywhere and not have to do it during work hours. Another way you can do pro bono that you might not think about is mentoring new attorneys um, that are legal services attorneys or other volunteer attorneys. An example that we have that we've done recently was we had an attorney in our office who filed a federal court action there's not really, we don't operate in federal court too much outside of the housing realm. So we didn't really have anybody on our staff that was able to navigate her and walk her through. And if people who operate in federal court know that that is a very different process than it is in state court. Um, so we had some attorneys that operated and worked in federal court quite frequently who assisted her on that. They would help her navigate and understand what types of things she needed to do and um, just navigate the process with the different judges. Another way, if you can't 
take a pro bono case, can't represent a client, is by drafting resources. Um, whether that's educational resources or pro se forms, there's so many different resources that we use in our office that, you know, if we had somebody that was sitting there who could draft them, who might were was a specialist in a certain area, they could do that. And that counts as pro bono. And then lastly, educating other attorneys, doing CLEs for everybody, presenting your knowledge to our staff, to other attorneys to educate and, you know, increase the knowledge base in the attorney field. That's another way that you don't think about, but is actually doing pro bono work um, according to those rules. So now that y'all have seen kind of what pro bono looks like, what all can be pro bono, let's move into who can volunteer. So the short answer is really anybody can volunteer. Um, there's so many different opportunities. It doesn't matter what your specialty is. It doesn't matter what type of work you do. There's so many different opportunities. And in fact, I've broken this down into different specialties, different areas that you can, and different examples of what you can do. So if you're a criminal law attorney, a lot of times, you know, through a legal services organization, since we don't do criminal defense, criminal law attorneys don't think they can take a pro bono case from our office because they don't see there being any need for it. However, we do have expungement work that works really well with those criminal attorneys because they have that knowledge base of criminal law that usually we don't have as much knowledge of. And same goes for our Restoration of Citizenship Rights Project, where we can use those criminal law attorneys to help go through that process and restore people their citizenship rights. If you're a family law attorney, there's ways that you can do a custody case with reduced fee or pro bono. Domestic violence divorces, this is obviously an issue that impacts so many people, and we've just seen an increase um, since COVID started on domestic violence um, in our community and the need for these divorces. And then um, termination of parental rights and adoptions. We see this quite frequently with um, the um, opioid epidemic, um, people who have um, been addicted um, and are still in addiction or unfortunately have lost their battle to addiction. And now somebody needs to raise their children that they had. And, you know, many times that's a grandparent who's coming to us needing custody or doing that um, adoption because um, it will help the client with different government benefits or things like that and just make it a little more permanent. So we have these options, once again, in traditional pro bono and reduced fee. If you're an elder law attorney, which I know that specialty is a little smaller, but we've got opportunities for simple wills and powers of attorney. And these are not going to be, you know, complex wills like Justice Bivens were talking about earlier, where people are fighting over, you know, multi-million dollar houses. These are going to be simple wills where all the client's state estate is going to be divided between their children or just a couple of people. Conservatorships. I know these aren't always elder law is related issues, but you know, many elder law attorneys know how to do a conservatorship and know how to serve as a guardian at litem. And then real estate attorneys. Um, many real estate attorneys struggle to figure out how they can take cases because they might not want to go to court. Um, many real estate attorneys never go to court, and that's why they are real estate attorneys. They don't want to. So there are, are opportunities with affidavits of airships and quick claim deeds for real estate attorneys to get involved. So what if you're not in West Tennessee? You're a virtual attorney. I know there's a lot of people on this call who don't live in our service area, um, who might want to volunteer, who might want to get involved. There's ways you can do that. Expungements, wills and powers of attorneys, restoration of right, citizenship rights, conservatorships. We've talked about all of those virtual opportunities, as well as disaster clinics and mentoring. All of these can be done from your couch, from your office, from anywhere to be able to assist these clients. And it really, one of the things that COVID taught us was 
there's so much technology that can be used to be able to create relationships virtually and um, be able to help people even if you're not there or even if you are in West Tennessee and you're in one of our rural counties where there's not many attorneys. Um, if you're a government attorney, an in-house attorney, or really any other option that I didn't mention, so I insurance defense attorney, a um, personal injury attorney, or anything else, you can still get involved through these virtual clinics, or like I said, through drafting forms or resources or doing training or simply doing research. A lot of times, you know, we're really busy going, going, going because there's not as many of us, but just taking time, if you you might already have research put together that you could send and say, here, here's some research I've got, or I've done some research on this topic. You know, we've we've got ways to really plug in just about anybody into, into pro bono and give everybody the ability to, to volunteer. So now what do we do to make volunteering easy? Um, WTLS screens all cases for merit. I have conversations with clients. I look into cases. I really screen them to make sure that I am not sending volunteers a terrible client or a terrible case. These piece, Some might slip through the cracks, but that's why you're only agreeing to handle, to do a consultation and then make the decision. But we screen for merit. I do not send out cases or even ask attorneys to take a case where there's not going to be merit or where it's just a bad case. Um, that's a waste of everyone's time and resources. We'll provide advice to the client, explain why it's a, you know, their position might not be that great, um, explain what they can do, educate them so they don't make the same decision, same mistake twice. Um, but we don't send those out through pro bono. Like I said, you create your own retainer. Um, all volunteers in our office has ac have access to our forms and our documents. We have form banks, we have research banks, we have document automation software, we have so many opportunities so you don't have to recreate the wheel. So you can just take our forms, take our things that we use and fill them in and move on and not have to generate documents that take a lot of time. We also provide free training and resources. Um, recently, we did a training on conservatorships because we realized that that was a problem that people might not know how to do a conservatorship case. Last week, we partnered with statewide um, people to do statewide partners to do a training on restoration of citizenship rights because we're about to launch that project. We also have annual seminars and um, other types of trainings where we're really trying to increase our resources and increase and increase our training um, modules and banks to where people can always turn to those trainings and know what they're doing. And lastly, in Tennessee, if you do pro bono work, you actually get free CLD credit. For every five hours of pro bono work, you get one CL one dual CLD credit. Um, up to five per year. So by doing pro bono work, you can actually get CLE credit and then not have to sit through um, ethics seminars like this one. So how do we do a clinic? Um, we screen our clients. If it's an expungement clinic, we pull those records. We look at them. We make sure that they do qualify for an expungement. Um, if you are interested, though, in screening those people may, and seeing if people qualify, we can actually have you do that if you don't want to do the actual representation. Um, but we want to make it as easy as possible on people. Then we use our um, software to generate forms. You get a link. You ask the client of question and you fill it out and it's going to automatically generate your form. Um, this makes it incredibly easy. Um, you don't really have to know that much information about the topic to be able to use the software and be able to generate the forms that the client needs. 
And then we handle the execution of the documents. So if it's a will or power of attorney, we schedule the client to come into our office to sign the form. If it's an expungement, we will have those clinics where clients come by, they sign it, it's given to the clerk or sometimes even the judge signs then. So all you're really responsible for at the clinics is making that phone call to the client and gathering that information to generate those forms. And if you don't want to use the forms that are the software, that's perfectly fine. You can use your own forms. We just have the software to make it as easy as possible. So I'm going to quickly run through our software and what the expungement clinic looks like. Everyone should have this little example. Um, and in the PowerPoint, you should actually have this link to our software, which I will pull up and hope that actually I already have it pulled up. If you give me one moment, I will see that and make sure that this is going properly. Um, if for some reason you can't see our um, software, which says gavel at the top, um, just let me know. But you all should actually be able to follow along with it and um, do our um, complete our little project that we have here in the last little bit. So most of our expungement clinics are actually clinics where we're helping people with dismissals. Um, a lot of people don't qualify for conviction expungement, so we tend to help people get their dismissals removed from their record. And I just wanted to kind of walk through how easy this is to do and to complete for a client. So you will get a link to this form. You'll get a party detail report, which all of y'all actually have in the Dropbox that just says expungement example. Um, and then you'll call the client. You might have to ask them some information um, or you might have a lot of that information. So on, I try to think of a real world example, um, which I did. Um, so in the example we have, a very recent example of a dismissal by a district attorney, which was Alec Baldwin. So his case was dismissed, but it's still showing up on his record because um, he was arrested and it's in the court system. So we want to get that expunged. So you're going to call the client and you're going to take this party detail report and put the client's name in. Then you're going to ask what the client's race is and ask what their legal sex was at the time of the arrest. And you're going to put their birth date in, which I have here. Then you're going to put their social security number in for the petition. Most of our clients don't have an OCA number. Other places they do, but in rural West Tennessee, they don't. Um, in our example, these are in O'Brien County and the courthouse is located in Union City. And it was in general sessions for the sake of this. Then you're gonna hit continue. Then you're gonna have the docket number, which everyone will be given, which I will put in. And if there's no circuit docket number, you obviously won't do it. You'll look at the date the charges were filed, which should be in the party detail report. And what date the defendant was arrested. You might not always have this information, but um, many times it'll be the same as when the charges were filed, but not always, but some of the clients will remember. If not, it's an opportunity to leave it blank, but we're just gonna assume that he, for the sake of this, that he was arrested in 2021. The arresting agency, will once again, not always be known. Select how many charges are being expunged under this. So this one, the name of the charge was voluntary manslaughter. There's no other charges, those are left blank. Many times this will be the same. And according to the party detail for the report, this was dismissed and you hit continue and you've gathered all this information, you need to edit it because you see a typo, 
you click there. And then you hit continue again. And you review it. And then by hitting continue and giving the software a minute to think, it will automatically generate your PDF and your Word document for what needs to be filed in court. So by taking just less than five minutes, you've automatically generated that petition um, that is needed. And in our current example, he's got two charges that need to be expunged because we found a 1995 charge. So we've generated the one document and all we have to do is go back and add the other information in. And just for the sake of keeping this quick, we'll change that or we'll keep that the same and just change the charge. And then this one was a no true bill return according to the detail report and you hit continue. Once again, you check it again and then you've automatically generated that petition. Um, so like I said, we try to make it as easy as possible. Um, I did have a question from someone. These forms are actually just a link. So you don't have to have the software download it. I, um, I, everybody who volunteers, I send this link to and in their browser, they just pull it up and generate it. And then they can download it as a docx file or they can e just email it to me um, for the clinic and it's that simple um, these expungement forms should work in all courts we use them in jackson city court because it's the standard um, form that's i think per, um, given to us by the district attorney general's conference um, and we have used them there and then we have other forms as well so now to go back to quickly finish up the um presentation. So where do we go from here when it comes to pro bono? So like I've made it clear, it's our my job to make it as easy as possible to volunteer. So by doing that, that's going to be providing more forms, doing more research, or assisting in any way possible. Um, we try to make it as easy as possible. Um, some of that is going to be through technology, increasing technology. However, sometimes technology is more burdensome, burdensome than it is useful. So we're not going to ever force any form of technology on anyone if that's going to make their job harder. We provide some of this technology because it's easier for some of us, but not everyone. But to connect with our most rural clients, sometimes technology is so much easier because they might be so far away from an, ur from an urban area to have access to attorneys. So we try to bridge that divide to make sure that regardless of where they are, regardless of their zip code, they are gonna you know, have access to an attorney um, if they can't afford one. We're looking to expand these virtual appearance opportunities in court. Um, I've already had a conversation with one of, one of our chancellors who told me that she wants to, any opportunity that can be used to provide someone a pro bono attorney, even if that means a virtual appearance, she is willing to look at it and willing to try to make that work because there's so many people in our rural counties who can't afford anyone, and there's so few attorneys in many of these counties. So once we get this conservatorship project fully rolled out, we'll look at expanding that to see how else we can we can use the, the this opportunity for. We also are looking to increase more use of all student volunteers just to make our attorneys' jobs easier, um, whether that's collecting information, whether that's drafting forms, whether that's just doing initial conversations with clients. It, once again, if it is easier on you as an attorney, we're gonna do that. Some situations, it's probably just easier for attorney to do this and get it over with, but in some situations, there might be law students who can help. We also are looking to provide more training, more opportunities for people to learn about the areas of law that we need people to take more work in, um, more opportunities for new attorneys who might not have much experience to look through and be able to 
learn and take something from what we're doing and not just grow as one of our volunteers, but grow and gain experience as a new attorney and getting that trial work or getting that document prep work that they might not get um, in the firm that they're working at. And then we also, we seek feedback from every event we do, every clinic we do, every new initiative. We are always asking our volunteers to provide us feedback and we take that very serious. Our program cannot work without volunteers. We can't function without volunteers. And we want to make sure that we are providing the opportunities, the training, everything necessary for your experience to be something that you want to come back to, that you want to enjoy doing. Um, so don't hold back any criticism you have. If you do a clinic that didn't go well, let me know. You know, I'm in a little bubble here. Um, Y'all are the volunteers who are out there and I rely on your feedback to really make sure that your experience is what it needs to be, that you're provided with those tools. And one way we are doing this is West Tennessee Legal Services this year was awarded a pro bono innovation fund planning grant from the Legal, Legal Services Corporation. It's a pilot grant that's only a six month long grant but we're only one of three organizations that were actually picked to get this grant in the country. And the goal of that grant is to, we have a consultant that we've engaged in to examine our program, look at what we can do better and look at where we can make improvements through pro bono to make it easier for our clients and for our volunteers. So the goal of this pilot grant is to actually get a, full transformation grant next year that will really allow us to dive in to make these changes to make it as easy as possible. So really quickly before we end, we do have a few upcoming clinic opportunities that I can send out um, with all the information at the end of this. We have two expungement clinics coming up where you can volunteer remotely and make those clients when it, or make those calls to those clients whenever you need to. Um, and those are in O'Brien County and Crockett County. We've launched a partnership with the Department of Mental Health and Substance Abuse to help people who are in recovery um, clear as much off of their record as they possibly can. Um, so we're really engaging with them and engaging in the reentry or recovery community for these clinics. We also, to celebrate Giving Tuesday this year, um, we decided that while we want to encourage financial contributions, we also want to encourage people to donate their time to us. So we are going to do another Simple Wills and Powers of Attorney Clinic on November 28th to celebrate Giving Tuesday. Um, the times on those are flexible. Um, and we would, you know, anybody who's interested in volunteering, um, you can sign up on actually the CLE form. You can mark that you're interested to vol in volunteering through our office. So that is all I have with three minutes to spare. And um, this is how you can contact West Tennessee Legal Services. Um, I should have put my contact on there, but you all have it because you all got an email from me. So um, you all have my information. Um, in these last few minutes, are there any questions that I, I can answer about our program, about what pro bono looks like, or about any of the things that I presented to y'all today. I'll give it a few minutes um, to allow for questions. And once again, I'd like to thank um, Justice Bivens for um, doing the introduction on this and all the Supreme Court has done um, to support access to justice. Um, especially by creating not just the Access to Justice Commission, but really trying to make sure that there's a faith and justice alliance and focus on bringing in faith communities um, because it is recognized that many people turn to their faith leaders um, in their times of need. So, you know, the Supreme Court has recognized that as well. Um, if there's no questions, um, I'll be sending out another email shortly, um, just in case you've lost the form for CLE request. Um, 
And then this is recorded. So if you missed any part, you want to go back or you know someone else who might benefit from this, um, they'll probably go live Monday or Tuesday of next week. It will be uploaded for anybody to be able to watch as well. But if there are no questions, um, thank you all for attending. And um, I look forward to hopefully being able to work with you all um, as volunteers um, as much as possible. So you all have a great rest of your day.